You're kind of on the same side of the equation as your customers. You both want the same thing. A really great product at a really good value. The entire Western capitalistic pricing model is getting broken. Oh my gosh, we are about to enter the absolute golden age of the entrepreneur. Welcome to Squaring the Circle. This is part three of our entrepreneurial tech trailblazing series featuring Bob Butler. In this episode, we delve into the future landscape of young entrepreneurs. With advancements in AI and innovative pricing models, could we be on the brink of a golden age for entrepreneurs? Lessons from the past, like Bob Butler's venture Best Thinking, reveal valuable insights about navigating an unpredictable technological landscape. Tune in for this inspiring and forward-thinking discussion as to what the future holds for tech entrepreneurs. Should we switch to one of my favorite projects? My personal favorite is Best Thinking. Why you are going in the old days to say Google and you see a lot of answers to any question, you don't know which one is good. Uh, you assume the first one, which is non advertised may be the good one, but you still have to scroll down and uh, not necessarily the best idea. And it was before ChatGPT. It's still 10, 10 years before ChatGPT will be on our market. But now, what is, is Jupiter really a planet or not? <laughs> you come to best thinking, all of a sudden you have the best answer. The best answer, uh, and it's peer reviewed, and it's 10, 10 years before ChatGPT. What a great project. Well, if you're, you know, the kind of entrepreneur I talked about where you just got to do this stuff, and I am, my retirement after my exit lasted exactly one year, and it was the worst year of my life. So I wanted to do something else, and that, that was best thinking. Best thinking looked like a publisher. It looked like an Amazon competitor. Best thinking was really kind of a stealth site to test the technology. The technology was really going to change the pricing model for content because everything in content is subscription model. And of course now everything is going subscription model. I have real problems with the subscription model. I, I think it's very dangerous model that leads to bad results, although everybody loves it. But it's like the honeymoon. They all love it now because they're in the honeymoon phase, but they're about to discover what's wrong with a subscription model which I think is great news for young entrepreneurs because we are about to enter an age of dislocation of entrenched high power, high market share companies because they're going to be facing a lot of problems because they've all switched over to the subscription model. I saw this coming, you know, 15 years ago because um, I am an economist. I mean, that, that's my background and I, I love this stuff. It's my catnip. And I, you know, I pay attention to these big economic kind of pricing model stuff. Some people golf, some people fish, <laughs> you know, this, this is what I do. I look up, worry about pricing model. As I first really ran into the subscription model was where it really was popularized. And that was with content, um, get your subscription to your newspaper and so on. I had this idea that I really wanted to develop um, a different way to buy your content. You know, I had some very interested groups like the Associated Press and and we were demonstrating for them the new model. And that's really what, what Best Thinking was about. Now we published a lot of books and we built readers and we, we did a lot of stuff that made us look like a publishing company, but that really wasn't the end game. You know, there's just so many ways that I have to kind of digress to, to explain this, but uh, I've always been really fascinated by Google's success because they did a lot of smart stuff and worked hard and did a lot of good people, especially in the early days, and they deserved their every success. But the differentiator, the thing they did different was so small, uh, yet it had such big consequences. And in the early days, if you can imagine, the biggest companies in search were the legal research firms because the only people who had to do online search were the lawyers because everything in law is based on precedent, meaning what did somebody else do? So if you were trying to convince a judge your point of view was right, the best way to do that 
was to show that other judges in other cases had ruled as you want this judge to rule. And that, how do you know that? Unless you're reading the law libraries in every courtroom in every state in the country. And so this idea of digitizing that first came out of law. So in the early days, West, LexisNexis, Fast, you know, these were the great search engines with big data centers. And, you know, we had a billion documents online and little startup companies came to us for investment. And one of those little startup companies was Google. We could have owned a big chunk of Google for pocket change if we had made different decisions. But it gave me a very interesting perspective to see Google, you know, kind of at that stage in the context of half a dozen other search engine companies who, who basically there was a transition. You were going away from banner advertising, you know, the banners on the websites to monetizing search results. And there were about eight different companies doing it at the time, all small startups. And the thing that fascinated me, all of them came to us because we were one of the big search engine companies. It was fascinating to me. There was only one thing that made Google look different. And there was this problem they all had is that people wouldn't trust the search results if they were paying for them. So you had to figure out the optimal mix of free organic search results and paid sponsored search results. So it all came down to finding just the right number and how you present them on a page that people say, okay, I've clicked on two or three organic search results. Those were pretty good. So now I'm going to click on a paid search result. And Google is the only company went out and they went into the Stanford Consumer Labs and AB tested everything on their screen design. And they didn't use focus groups and expert opinion. They used galvanic skin responses and eye focus and all these really high parametric techniques and just really, really optimized results on exactly what was the right mix. And I remember at the time, everybody felt, well, that's, that's, that's not a differentiator. I mean, that's not worth investing in. And, and they did one other thing. Um, they're actually a terrible search engine. Um, Bing is so much better. But what Google is, and, and why this is important, is their crawlers are magnificent. And it's actually a Finnish technology that, that all of that comes from. So Google had this results from the search lab and acquired some technology from an obscure Finnish company on crawling. And of course, crawling is a brute force activity. So they, they got the capital to build all these data centers. And they have these great crawl crawlers and this great interface, and this really kind of lousy search engine, um, and built this magnificent company. And to me, that's always been inspiring. That's just small details about consumer interface and what the real problem was. And the real problem wasn't giving somebody the right search results. The real problem was having the information to be able to present. And this is where I tell this story because it's very relevant today, because everything that's happening in AI, there's kind of like two flavors. There's the simple language model that's trying to emulate the human communication experience, which is really neat. And I use these tools all the time and I admire the tech, but it's the answers that count. And it's kind of like the early days of Wikipedia. It's very convenient, quick, easy, free answers. Who cares if they're not very good? And, you know, and so we're going through the same process with AI. And in the end, the winner will be the one who presentation is important, but it, it, it is going to be about the quality of the answers. Um, and and I, I see the whole AI industry kind of forgetting the lesson uh, of the early days. Um, and so like you know, chat BGT, um, you know, I was a subscriber and a huge fan from early on, you know, they're all excited about 4.0 because, you know, it laughs and it talks to you and everything else. But it's, it's really all driven by Bing. It's really just an interface on top of Bing. And, and, and it works really well because Bing is and always was a terrific search engine. Um, so it's, but 
the quality of the answers is still something that has to be addressed. You know, so circling back to best thinking, you know, this is a very age old area of interest for me. Best thinking just basically um, could not convince the world to stay away from the subscription model. I mean, it's just so tempting mm -hmm. for executives to have this continual stable revenue supply, the entire capital structure, the entire business structures all just worship this idea of the stability of a steady growing model. The, the bias in our systems towards that kind of economic activity is just so pervasive um, that, you know, we, we just just too big a problem for us to take on. Um, it's going to happen. It's going to change. And it's going to create enormous opportunities for a whole new generation of startups. Um, but it just hasn't played out yet. And I think to explain that, I have to talk a little bit about what's wrong with the subscription model. And you really see this when you run a software company, as I did, because soon after we sold Time Matters to LexisNexis, well, we had to convert to a subscription model, of course, because the big corporation wanted it. So unless you've really taken a company through the five, six year process of, of migrating your customers from a product priced model to a subscription model, you're, you're not going to really understand what I'm talking about. But uh, this is where my thoughts come from. They're not theoretical. And when you're selling a product, the way I like to describe it is you're kind of on the same side of the equation as your customers. You both want the same thing a really great product at a really good value because they want the product to be better all the time and you want to sell them a new product every cycle. So you want to make the product better all the time. So you're you're kind of both on the same page. You both want to make the product better and you want to charge more and they want to pay less. But you kind of very quickly, if you're making the product better, seem to figure out the right pricing. And so I, I kind of feel like when you're in a product pricing model, you're on the same side as your customer. You generally want the same thing, a good value and a good product. When you're on a subscription, you're not. And it's so interesting why that's so favored because you sell once and you've got revenue forever. That's ideal. In a product priced model, you have to resell every year. And reselling every year wasn't so bad when you could afford to sell, but now marketing's gotten so very expensive. So it's almost irresistible to say, I want to sell this customer once and then get revenue for 10 years. The problem is every year you want to give them less to make a little more margin. So you don't, you let your engineers go, you lose your talent, your product starts to get stale. And so every year the customer you know, is seeing a little less improvement, if any. Um, pricing is still kind of going up. In the meantime, there's new startups out there promising better products at better prices. So you think you are entitled to and you should be getting a better product. And, and so you start to get estranged is the word I like to use. You start to get estranged from your customer because you always want to give less and they always have rising expectations. And these become like ships headed in opposite directions passing in the night. And it has about an eight year cycle. Um, and I've studied this quite a bit. And it's pretty interesting to see it happen in every industry and in every product at every price point. The first two years, you're kind of transitioning everybody to the new model. You're selling that you have a good product with good value and you're making it better and it's just new and exciting. And then you have the honeymoon. It's about everybody's kind of happy and it's all running smooth and life is simple and the numbers are easy to manage. But then about year six, you know, customers start being unhappy. And you go, well, maybe we should invest a little more and, you know, give them a couple of good new features. Oh, what do you mean we don't have any engineers anymore? Well, we haven't needed them because we haven't been developing the product. And so suddenly you've lost the capability to make the product better. And there's all these startups out there selling vaporware that say they have all these things you don't have and can't make anymore. And so the customer's expectations really start to get uh, high. 
and you've lost the ability to meet those expectations. And then about year eight, there starts to be the mass migration. And and then everybody sits around in the boardrooms and starts panicking because not only are they not getting their critical numbers to keep their stock where they want it, they're actually seeing signs of migration. You know, people are leaving, which they never contemplated was possible. And so, of course, they start really investing in better marketing. Um, you know, they do everything but think about making the product better because now they've lost the talent to all the startups. And we're about year six, <laughs> you know, for, for a whole lot of businesses. And um, I saw this coming years ago. You know, I tried working really hard to um, have an alternative pricing model, at least in software and in content. Um, but I'm afraid it's going to have to play out and a whole new generation of entrepreneurs is going to benefit from it. Uh, I don't know exactly what the new model will look like, but if it's going to survive, it, it, it may appear to be a subscription, but the subscription will be much more connected to product improvements. There'll be no more of this paying every year for the same thing with very modest improvements. That's not sustainable in my view. So what you think in, in this light uh, about open AI pricing model, they'll yeah. sell you the tokens, right? Pretty much it's not a free, it's not quite subscription. Well, everybody's trying to find the new model. I mean, I, I'm seeing, I mean, to me, you know, I see it all happening, <laughs> you know? I, I, I can just tell there's a lot of people, a lot of boardrooms thinking, hmm, you know, this isn't quite working as good as we thought. And there's a bunch of services I use that have got some very, unique uh, pricing models. I got, I've got one voice to text model where they charge per character, which I'm kind of a fan of. I mean, that, that's yeah. basically what my model was. You pay for yeah. what you get. But then they have a monthly minimum that if you don't use, you lose. So it's a subscription mm -hmm. product hybrid kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you, you pay a subscription model. It gives you so many characters to convert. Um, but at the end of the month, if you if you do more, you pay more. If you do less, you lose it. And it's like, no, that's not it. It's close, you know, but that's not it. But really, the future economic opportunity is going to be based on who gets the pricing model right. I mean, this the, the, the entire Western capitalistic pricing model is getting broken. So young entrepreneurs out there are going to figure out the right model. Well, I know about you, Bob, is you are a big fan of thinking out of the box about the old problem. How, how it all developed with uh, best thinking? It was just too early. <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of my, my friends say, you know, if you it just was. quit being 30 yeah. years early on stuff, you'd do a lot better. Well, I, I think that there's just so many things that can be done better. I mean, there's so much opportunity. I'm, I'm just kind of so regret being old, not because of the aches and pains, but because, oh my gosh, we are about to enter the absolute golden age of the entrepreneur. There's just so many things that are, are really going to change. But, you know, best thinking was, was when I was young and, you know, had all the energy and, and that was my attempt to kind of capture some of these big, long-term structural changes because every great entrepreneurial opportunity has at its core some fundamental change in the way the economy or system works. You know, we forget that the first billionaires were all Pizza Hut type entrepreneurs and franchises. And that was all driven by the, the spouses going to work. You suddenly had two people working, so you had to pick up a pizza on the way home to get food on the table. And that created a whole new industry of franchise and fast food. Um, and if you look at each one of these new companies that became great companies, there was some fundamental change. And and there are fundamental changes now happening on an epic scale. Um, the pricing model is breaking. Uh, conflict is opening everywhere. Um, you know, securities are major, major issues. There, you know, AI is coming. I mean, these are, all of these are opportunity generators. So when you're trying to decide whether this idea you have is good enough for you to take the risk, one of the things you should look at is it driven by some fundamental change. 
And that's what I always tell people. That's where you start. Is something changed? And then the next thing you ask yourself is, do I have some special talent in this area? Do I, do I have something somebody else doesn't have that positions me to, to build something that responds to this change? And then the third thing is, do you have a differentiator? I mean, is there something you can do that will differentiate yourself? On that note, let's wrap up part three of the entrepreneurial tech trailblazing series. We hope you found it insightful. Be sure to check out part four, where we will be exploring strategies to help your business stand out amidst fierce competition. We'll also delve into the critical distinction between wanting to be an entrepreneur and simply not wanting a boss. Check out parts one and two for even more valuable insight on tech entrepreneurship. Don't miss a moment. We'll see you in the next episode.